I want to speak today a message that the Lord has put on my heart and I'm going to title it fertilizer of your future fertilizing your future deliverance removes bondage it does not remove battles in fact when you're not delivered you don't have battles you only have bondage when you get delivered you start having real battles and a chance to win them you start having real hardships and God's grace to overcome them you know when I look back in our early days of personally my testimony when I was a teenager we just came to the United States and I didn't speak English had extremely insecurities and phobias of people, struggled connecting with people, socially awkward, introverted, also had a very big paranoia of people. At the time my uncle, our pastor starts the church and you have to understand I come from a church in the Ukraine where we didn't clap, we didn't raise hands. So it was a culture shock, it was a religious shock for me. I'm 13 and a half years of age and on top of that when I was born there was a birth defect and some kind of a factory defect that happened where my optical nerve was damaged. So on the top of the culture shock, on the top of the religious shock here I am experiencing personal crisis because I have extreme migraine headaches that pills cannot help. I feel like I don't fit in anywhere. In school I'm struggling. I'm getting pretty much F's because I can't complete my assignments. I don't understand. I feel like I don't have any friends. Our church starts. I don't understand what's happening in the church because we brought drums and I thought drums are from the devil. And so you know my mom doesn't wear head covering because I come from a place where you have to wear a head covering not Muslims we were Christians but women wear head coverings and here you know like this the shock just hits me and finally this young church that my uncle starts thinking okay great this is gonna be a place I will find myself as a teenager this is what I will get loved this is what I will get fulfilled and this is I mean the church has really 15 members it's very difficult not to find a spot to serve I was wrong See, when your failure on the inside, you're carrying that, you project that failure everywhere you go. Precious worship team that was started, my cousin, Pastor Ilya, and the rest of the team, amazing musicians and singers. And I wanted to, you know, like when the church is very young and all the youth is on the stage, you kind of want to be what everybody is. Whether it's on the stage or in ushering or in media, anywhere. And it was my dream to be part of this worship team. And I finally got accepted. And I remember the day when I was kicked out of the worship team. Oh, how painful it was. I walked from my pastor's apartment and Ilya did, I mean, he's my best friend. He did the best he could. And you know, we tried to negotiate. I said, what if we keep me there? Just turn off my microphone. He said, Vlad, the microphone has been off for a while. Ah, <laughs> oh, that hurts. I said, well, you know, I'm okay not being on the stage. I could be somewhere behind the scenes. Can I at least do the sound? You know, can I just fix the sound? I was like, I mean, I don't have to shine. I know I'm not good looking. I know like this just put me in the back. And they said, well, the problem is if you're on the back running the soundboard, you have to have a better hearing than on the stage. And the only place where I felt like I can finally be accepted and loved and fulfilled, that place kicks me out too. Shortly after that, I have a car accident. A person runs me over and says, it's my fault. Literally, I would, when I look at my life, I see failure after failure after failure. I'm not talking about moral failure. I'm talking about when life just treats you badly. And the word that God has given me today to share with some of you that came here today who are in that season, and that is this, failure is not final. It is your fertilizer. Failure is like a manure. It stinks but it's necessary to fertilize your life. Because I was rejected in this case, 
it was God's redirection for me to learn to pray, for me to see God, for me to get on my knees and not to find my identity on the stage but to find my identity on my knees. Not to find my identity in the fact that I'm accepted in American culture but in the fact that I'm accepted by God. Not to find my identity in my visibility but to find my value in the fact that Jesus died on the cross. He bled for me. He washed me with His blood and He has a purpose for my life. I'm not an accident. I wasn't born an accident on this earth. I have a purpose and my purpose is to fulfill and to serve God. And I am a testament today that whatever that you are going through, God has brought you to this place and God wants to light a fire inside of you. If you're listening to me right now or you're a young person and the devil is lying to you and the devil is saying, listen, your life is a mistake. You are an accident. You're just cruising through. I'm here to slap that lie out of your life and to remind you, you have a purpose and you are here on an assignment. Can somebody say amen? amen? The Bible says about Joseph and I'll touch the sto Joseph's story today. Psalm 105 verse 17. He sent a man before them, Joseph. And I want you to see God's assignment, how it begins. Who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with feathers. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came to pass the word of the Lord tested him what you're facing today is either a test or a reward if it's not a reward it's most likely a test but God allows these tests so he can develop us and prepare us for a new season in life every trouble you face every challenge you face is like a knife you can take it by the handle or you can take it by the blade if you take a knife by the handle it becomes a tool and a weapon if you take it by the blade you bleed to death as a teenager I took my problems at by the blade and I complained I would cry out to God why did you allow this Lord what did I deserve why did you create me like this why did you allow me to be born like this Lord why did you not we're not paying attention to that communist doctor who damaged my optical nerve Lord why and why and as long as I was putting my why in the way of God's will I was bleeding and the devil didn't have to attack me anymore I did the work for him I was destroying myself. I was hurting myself. And there are some of you here today, your situation is ruling your life and the devil is no longer sending demons because you are destroying yourself. And my desire is to inject you with faith today, to inject you not with hype, but with hope from God. There are God is not done with you. You are not breathing air on this earth an accident. If you're going through hell, to keep on going because there is a breakthrough on the other side of your breaking. Can somebody say amen? If you're taking notes, I want you to write down number one. Failure is not final, it is a fertilizer. Genesis 50 and 20, it says the following. But as for you, you meant evil for me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about in as in this day to save many people alive the devil will always say failure is final god will say it's a fertilizer now for those of you who know what fertilizer is it's not something you put in your salad it stinks it's terrible you gotta wash your hands after you use it but your lawn needs it your fields require it. What if I were to tell you that in this broken world, marred by sin and evil, God doesn't send failure. But since it's already there, God takes advantage of it. Since it's already in your life, God recycles it. Since it's already there, God says, I can use it to my advantage and to your purpose. 
That's what Joseph said to his brothers. He says, you meant it for evil. You sold me like a slave. You were debating whether to assassinate me and finally you came up with a smart solution to sell me for the price of a slave. I was sold. I was rejected. I was thrown into the Potiphar's house. I was accused and lied. My life went from bad to worse to hellish and even worse. But Joseph looks back at his life and he doesn't complain. He doesn't blame. He says, you know what? It was not fair, but it was in my fertilizer. Because of what I went through, God put me in the right place and now He's using me to touch other people's lives. That failure is not final, but it's a fertilizer. Can somebody say amen? amen. Failure is an event. It's not a person. You are not a failure. You might have failed, but failure is not who you are. It's what you did. And today Jesus' blood can wash you and forgive you. If you are here and you are a failure in the sense that you live separated from God, you make mistakes and that's what you're defined by. Today the Lord is going to extend mercy and He will rewrite your identity because when we become Christians, God gives us new identity. He calls us new creation. He says all things have gone and God changes us from who we were to who we are in Him. Can somebody say Amen? I want you to notice the second thing. God doesn't leave us when our seasons change. Life is made out of seasons. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, 22, in Psalm 35, in Psalm 102, 13, Ecclesiastes 3, 1, Daniel 2, 21, Galatians 6, 9, 2 Timothy 4, 2, we see constant reference to life as seasons. Your life will have cycles. Seasons have winter. Like right now we have winter. It's cold. It's raining. We have summer. We have spring and we have fall. So it is with life. Life will have seasons. And what we must understand about Joseph, not only there was a bunch of failures that God chose to use those failures as a fertilizer for his purpose and his calling, but I want you to notice another thing about Joseph's life is that Joseph had four seasons in his life and they were marked by four types of clothing. The first season was the good season. It was when his dad favored him. He had dreams. He had visions from God. His father gave him a colorful garment. This season didn't last very long as most of good season don't last very long because that season the clothing was ripped off of him and he got thrown into a season of a slave. The second season is he was a slave. When he was a slave, they gave him a clothing of a slave. It wasn't colorful garment, it was a slave garment. This season didn't last, it was a hard season, but sometimes hard season don't last either. Hard season, I know we want to be encouraged that hard seasons become good season for Joseph. Hard season turn into hellish season. So for those of you who are going through hard, it can get worse. It got bad. Potiphar's wife ripped his clothes and lied about it. There was a cycle of people lying in Joseph's family about clothes. His daddy did that. That's how he got the birthright. And this cycle wasn't broken and this cycle was affecting Joseph of lies, conspiracy, attacks about clothes. He gets thrown into jail and life gets even harder in jail because he doesn't have an attorney. This is not America where you can write an appeal. You pretty much are stuck in that dungeon. He goes from a slave to a prisoner and he is stuck in there. But there comes a point and God eventually takes him from that place into the last season of his life. And we see when Potiphar puts, when Pharaoh, I'm sorry, puts a garment on Joseph and now Joseph steps into the prime minister role and he carries this garment and he breaks the cycle of lying, breaks the cycle of cheating and break the cycle of all kinds of conspiracy that's been going on in his family. What I find interesting, in four seasons his father gave him a colorful coat, Potiphar gave him a slave coat, a warden gave him a prisoner coat 
and then Pharaoh gave him a prime minister code. Only two seasons of Joseph's life the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. It does not say when he was blessed by his dad that the Lord was with him. We know God was with him but God doesn't highlight that. The Bible doesn't say the Lord was with him when he became a prime minister. It's kind of obvious when you're prime minister God is doing something in your life. It's when you're going through hell and there is no evidence that God is anywhere near you. That God finds it needed and important to highlight I'm still there. My name is Jehovah Shama, the Lord who is there. His name is Emmanuel, mean God with us. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them. And he says, and lo, I am with you always. In the hard time, in the hellish time, in divorce, when you're alone, when you're rejected, when you're sacked, when you are waiting, when everybody else gets promoted, when it seems like you've done your best and nothing is turning around, the Lord is with you. When your seasons change, God doesn't switch. When you go in through breaking, God doesn't break up with you. God is not a friend that sticks with you when you're popular and you're rich and you're famous. God stays with you through the fire. He stays with you through the valley. He stays with you through the furnace. He stays with you through heartbreak, confusion and doubt. He doesn't leave your side. Whatever you're going through right now, maybe a very difficult season of your life, perhaps the most hardest thing you've ever been through and you're confused and you say, how could God ever allow that? If God is with me, why am I going through these things? I want to tell you something, God's presence does not equal absence of problems. God never promised that because He's with you, everything will be easy. He just promised because He's with you, you will overcome whatever comes your way. Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When the Lord was with me when I was a teenager and would lock myself in the room, it didn't cause my pain to pass away, but it gave me strength to overcome that. It gave me strength to endure that. And somebody is here today who needs to hear that, that the Lord has not left your side. You know, when we got pregnant, and about a month um, into the pregnancy, my wife started to have very heavy bleeding. And it's common for women who are pregnant to have bleeding. Um, and I remember the night, it was Sunday night, where things got really bad and I, I was shook. I don't remember last time I was shook this strongly. And my wife woke me up and I see blood in the room and in the bathroom everywhere and it's just and she's fainting and she says I'm not doing good we need to go to the emergency I've never been to I, I don't go to emergencies I don't I'm healthy she's healthy I don't even know where to find the emergency I start googling where do you go and I remember we go to emergency and before we went there um, something came out of my wife's body that looked like a baby it was just a bunch of cells and it looked like look look something and, and honestly there was this thing that came into me the fear of the enemy saying you know what you're not gonna have the baby you just lost the baby and we were in the hospital and for those of you who've carried had miscarriage this is not to bring traumatizing memories to you but to also just bring encouragement because I was there in the hospital we were there from pretty much all night and I remember flipping through my iPhone and looking just for the word from the Lord and this verse came in that honestly became a a strength for me and this is going to be for somebody else here today where it says in Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 9 you whom I've taken from the ends of the earth called from its furthest regions and said to you you are my servant I have chosen you and have not cast you away. And I felt like the Lord was speaking this to me and He says, I brought you from the furthest parts of this world here. And you are my servant. And then He said this, fear not, 
for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. And I felt right there in that emergency, not that everything's going to be okay with the baby, but that everything's going to be okay with me. Not in a selfish way, but in the fact that God says, I am with you right here. And whatever happens, I'm not leaving your side. You're not alone in this struggle. And the doctors came and they said, everything is fine with the baby. The baby, you didn't lose the baby. Just, just everything, it's just bleeding is bad. We started to continue to pray, then the bleeding stopped. And I want to encourage somebody here today that whatever you are going through, God is saying to you from His Word, I am with you. Do not be afraid. I will uphold your hand. I got you in the palm of my hand. The Bible says the Lord said about Joseph that the Lord was with Joseph. His life was getting worse, but God's presence was still with him. And because God was with Joseph, the Bible says he prospered in every place that he was in. They took his job and they put him as a slave and he prospered there. They put him as a prisoner and he prospered there. And I'm here to remind you, your blessing is not connected to your boss, it's connected to your God. Your job is a resource, your God is your source. And he says he's not going to leave you. I'm here to remind you, your blessing is not connected to your position, it's connected to God's presence. Stay close to God's presence because God says He will not leave you. He will not depart you and therefore stay connected to Him and you can prosper in the wilderness. You can prosper in a hospital room. You can prosper on the welfare check. You can prosper in the difficult seasons of your life because God is with you. Can somebody say amen? Maybe those of you are saying, but look at my circumstances. It doesn't seem like God is with me. In Isaiah, it says this, Isaiah 49 verse 14, can a woman, it, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my God has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. Don't look at your pain as a confirmation that God's presence is not with you. Don't look at your struggle as an evidence that God dropped you. Don't look at the fact that you were rejected, abandoned and mistreated as a sign and an evidence that God has forsaken you. The proof that the Lord is with you is His scars. In Isaiah it says, he says, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands and your walls are always before you. That means that my circumstances are not an indication of God's love or God's presence. It's His Word and the cross of Jesus Christ that is an indication. That means after you get delivered, after you get healed and you go back home and the symptoms try to come back into your life or maybe life gets more challenging and more difficult and you notice that you know things don't turn around. Find assurance today that listen God will use every bad thing to advance His kingdom in your life. Find assurance today. You are never alone when you are with Jesus and He is walking with you and He will never forsake you and He will use that failure to bring forth fertilization in your life. Can somebody say amen? I want you to notice another thing about Joseph. Not only Joseph knew how to, that the Lord, the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph, but the scripture says in Genesis 42 verse 18, then the Joseph said to them the third day, do this and live for I fear God. Number three, stay faithful when life is not fair. Stay faithful to God. Walk in the fear of God. The fear of God is not being afraid of God. It's being afraid to be away from the Lord. And Joseph said this, he says, I'm not going to hurt you to his brothers. I know I'm powerful and with the snap of fingers, y'all can die, but I won't do that. Why? He doesn't say because I love God. He says because I fear Him. Many Christians have relationship with God and don't have reverence for God. And therefore, when life is not fair, they're not faithful. They're not on fire. They're only on fire when life makes sense. They're only on fire when prayers are answered, expectations are met and everything seems to be okay. 
the moment things don't go their way God didn't answer the prayer certain expectations were not met what begins to happen is they leave the Lord it's not because they don't love God they just don't fear him and God is raising a generation of people who fear God and that fear of God will consume every fear of man fear of death fear of failure fear of marriage fear of divorce fear of elevators fear of children fear of not having children fear of losing your job every known fear unto man gets consumed by the fear of God God doesn't want to remove fear he wants to replace it with the fear of God the, Joseph had a fear of God this is why when the Potiphar's wife was flirting with him he didn't flirt back he fled the temptation instead of flirting with temptation when you're going through a difficult time the devil will offer temptation he will offer drugs he will offer alcohol he will offer numbing mechanisms he will offer an affair he will offer binge watching pornography why because he will say will your life already is hard God has abandoned you curse God and die and just numb yourself with this sin but if you have a fear of God it won't matter what you're going through you will say I'll stay faithful even when life is not fair. I will stay with integrity even when my life has pain. I am not gonna put wicked things before my eyes even if everything is not working out in my life. Why? Because I fear God. You won't flirt with sin. You will run from sin. You want to ask a question, how close to sin can you get and still make it to heaven? You won't be sitting on the fence halfway into the world and halfway into God. You will go hard after God even if life is difficult. Though He slay me, yet I will trust Him. Why? Because I fear God. I look at the generation of my parents and yes they were traditional and yes they were conservative and some of us call them religious but there is one thing that generation had that my generation lacks is they had the fear of God they did not have a Bible degree they did not know Greek and Hebrew but they knew one thing there is a God in heaven and what you do behind a closed door he's watching and yes, they may have lacked intelligence in some areas, but they compensated with lack of that with wisdom. Because the Bible says wisdom comes from the fear of God. Wisdom does not come from your college. Wisdom does not come from your connections. Wisdom does not come because your mama has a PhD and your daddy has a master's. Wisdom comes because you fear God. You can be an intelligent fool have more degrees than a thermometer and I believe in degrees but not put your life together because without the fear of God you cannot have wisdom without the fear of God you will not have integrity without the fear of God you will not have consistency in your step come hell or high water and we have a generation today that has a greasy grace. They simply believe that just because God is good and I love Jesus, me and Jesus hashtag are cool. I take him to KFC with me all the time. We are bodies with Jesus. Yes, Jesus is your friend, but he is also your Lord. He's also the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Four living creatures and 24 elders bow and lay their crowns at this man we call Jesus. Demons tremble at the sound of his name. And Jesus is not just a spare tire for an accident on the road. Jesus is not an insurance card in case there is a hell. Jesus Christ is somebody who is worthy of every ounce of your worship. Come hell, high water. Somebody shout, fear God. Somebody shout, fear God. Without the fear of God, we will lack wisdom. Without the fear of God, we will lack holiness. When Potiphar's wife came to Joseph and they said, sleep with me. And I, he responded, he said, how can I do this wickedness before God? wickedness men who only have relationship with God but don't have the reference reverence of God you know how we call lust weakness how we call sin defeat instead of disobedience how we call our struggle see struggle is if you can't lift 200 pounds struggle is not when you're indulging in pornography that's not a struggle that's indulgence 
and what we do today because we lack the fear of the Lord is this we call sin a weakness mistake Joseph called it wickedness before God because we lack the fear of God we call abortion choice and we say love is love well if love is love toilet water is water the Bible says woe to people who call what is good evil and what is evil good we have a generation that needs to reclaim back old-school old-fashioned fear of the Lord I know it's out of style but it's not out of sync with God. God honors people to fear Him. What will get you through a difficult time is fear of God. You know my great-grandfather who sat in jail for the cause of Christ, he didn't endure that only because he loved God. He trembled before His Word. People feared God. Today we have a generation of spineless snowflakes the sun comes up, hardship, any hardship comes up, that's it, I don't believe in Jesus. And I wonder sometimes, did you ever believe in Jesus? Because real faith is not like paper that gets burned by fire. Real faith is like gold that gets purified by fire. And if the fire destroyed your faith, I wonder, did you ever have any? We need to get the fear of God in our life. Can somebody say amen? amen. What the fear of God allows is this, the fear of God allows us to have holiness, not legalism. When you have religion, you will have legalism. But when you have a reverence before God, you will have holiness. Other people will call you a legalist. Other people will call you too much, too much into Jesus. Too religious, too fanatical. But what they don't understand is there is a flame inside that fuels your passion to live a holy life when nobody's watching. And that flame is not fear of hell. It's the fear of God. Healthy reverence for Almighty God who gave His Son to die on the cross for you, who loves you unconditionally, yet He's still a concern consuming fire if you want to have a shortcut into your destiny God has a highway it's called highway of holiness in Isaiah it says there will be a highway and the wicked will not get on it many of us take the country roads of compromise we take the exits of shortcuts we take exits of sleeping around, flirting with sin and temptation because we lack the fear of the Lord. We can speak in tongues 300 miles per hour. We can even have a Bible degree, but the Bible college doesn't give you the fear of God. Memorizing the Bible might not give you the fear of God. Yes, it's the Holy Spirit inspiring God's Word to give you the fear of God and that causes you to live a holy life. And holiness is important with us because without holiness, nobody can see God. You can't live in sin, practice sin and expect that when you are meeting Jesus because you prayed a magic prayer, God doesn't even say to pray, you will go into heaven. The Bible says in the last days, Jesus will say, many called me Lord, Lord, but they lived in sin. They practice lawlessness and He's not going to say, I understand you. Hashtag struggle is real. No, He will say, I never knew you. You may say, Vlad, you're scaring me. I hope I do. I want to wake you up. I'll rather scare you into heaven than make you happy into hell. <laughs> Holiness is what God is expecting out of us. The Bible says in Isaiah that there is a highway of holiness and this holiness is the highway that leads us into success and Joseph took a shortcut into his destiny and that shortcut was purity if you want to get a shortcut into your destiny it is not flirting with sin it is not compromising it is living holy for God it will seem like you're not sleeping around and all other of your friends are sleeping around right now and they're coming on Monday and they're saying who they slept with and what kind of sex things that they did and you're there the weirdo. Listen, set a clock and in 10 years down the road you will see who the weird one is. And you will go into a local sauna after a workout and you will hear the stories of real weirdness. Second marriage, third marriage, fourth marriage, heartbreak. 
sitting with home with a dog and with a cat and that's it and cannot put their life together why because if you take the country road of compromise you'll end up in a dead end but if you take the highway of holiness you will end up in a happy marriage you will end up in a place where God is going to bless your relationships God will protect you from sexually transmitted disease God will protect you from sexually transmitted demons God will protect you from demonic soul ties God will protect you from unwanted pregnancy God will protect you from a heartbreak and what you will discover is there is a highway of holiness and this highway leads to palace and this highway leads to pleasure and this highway leads to God's success and this highway honors God somebody shout holiness this is the will of God Paul says in Thessalonians your sanctification you want to know God's will if you're a teenager you say what does God want me to do stay pure because God's will is found in God's way get in God's way you will end up in God's will get on a highway of holiness you will end up you'll never miss your destiny if you stay on the highway of holiness but what does God want me to do with my career what does God want me to do with the church which church to join make sure that you stay on the right track of God's righteousness and God's holiness you will never miss God's will because God's will is found in God's way seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness we have a generation that soaks and they love to spend time with Jesus and smoke weed Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so but you're a pothead but Jesus accepts me the way I am the Bible doesn't just say seek the kingdom of God it says and his righteousness God is a holy God he is separate from the wickedness the nature of God is so not connected to our nature like fire in your head you put your hand in the fire and the fire burns your hand because it's the nature of fire to be fire God's nature is holy he doesn't become unholy to accommodate you and me Joseph had no Bible Joseph had no mentor and Joseph did not have any kind of purity app on his phone Joseph did not have accountability what Joseph had is the fear of God and the fear of God caused him to run from sin instead of flirt with that chica many of us we have a Bible we have a church we have a pastor and we claim to love, to love God what we lack is the fear of God and that's why we constantly flirt with sin my goal is not to condemn you but today to wake us up to realize when life is hard the enemy will whisper and say it's okay to masturbate it's okay to get intoxicated you, you just numb yourself it's okay to overeat it's okay to spend your evening in the bar you're just under a lot of pressure it's okay to numb yourself in front of a television like in front of a throne it's okay why we, we, we God, God understands no he doesn't he's a holy God and he says come to me my son come to me my daughter and my presence and my power and my spirit is going to help you to get through whatever that you are going through don't use your suffering as an excuse to slack in your holiness and in your righteousness we are living in the last days and God is setting the remnant and God is setting us apart from the world and the time has come we don't dress like strippers on Halloween a time has come we don't look like this world and claim to change this world a time has come where we don't conform to this world we are transformed by the renewing of our mind we live a separate life we live a distinct life we live a life of light not darkness we live a life of salt not sugar we live a life that is holy we live a life that is righteous we don't imitate the ways of this world the world is not going to be a part of us we are going to change it by the power of God And if that offends you, if you're here today and you're not a believer and you're offended, I'm believing the Holy Spirit will touch you. If you're a Christian and you're offended, please be offended. We cannot claim to cast out demons and dress like demons one night of the week, of the year. On. Pastor Vlad, this is legalism. It's not legalism. We should desire not to look like the world. We should desire to be like our Lord. 
we should seek to be holy like him no holiness is not a suit holiness is being separate to him in our thoughts and in our minds it's what's happening behind the scenes that nobody's seeing it's what's happening in my thoughts and in my mind it's what's happening in my dms it's am i clearing the browsing history when nobody's watching am i closing the laptop because somebody just walked in am i hiding stuff under the pillow am i deleting the transactions it's what nobody is seeing that's the kind of holiness god is expecting amen i know some of us are here today and you wanted me to blame your demons but we have a role to play, to walk holy before God. Can somebody say amen. I'm going to give a call to salvation in just a moment. But Joseph, not only he chose the highway of holiness, the path of purity, he sped his process. But I want you to notice is that Joseph served the dreams of others when his own dreams were dead. Joseph interpreted the dreams of others when his dream seemed dead. Abraham prayed for the barren women when his wife was barren. Joe prayed for his friends when he was broke. Slave girl evangelized to Naaman while she was in slavery. Jesus healed while being arrested. Jesus evangelized to the crimin while hanging on the cross. Paul built fire after shipwreck and a storm. Paul and Silas were singing hymns to God while they were in prison. What that means is that when you are in your difficult time, don't compromise. But second thing, when you are in your difficult time, don't use it as an excuse to not serve. Your pain is not an excuse to not serve God. Your pain is not an excuse to live in self-pity. Poor little me. Everybody pay attention to me. You have to get out of yourself and understand the Son of God did not come. The Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and give His life for ransom. To be like children of God, we are supposed to take our eyes off of our pain. We're not ignoring our pain. We're not belittling our pain. We're not minimizing what we're going through. We're just not giving it power to trap us in our past. We're not giving it power to trap us in our present. We are saying we will not be ruled by our trauma. We will not be ruled by our pain. We will not be ruled by what the haters said. We will not be ruled how our life is unfair. We will serve in spite of that. Why? Because life is like tennis. Those who serve well seldom lose. I interviewed Don Piper. He was a minister, a Baptist minister who was on the way from a, from a pastor's conference driving back home 38 years of age and in Gen on January 18, 1989 a 18-wheeler truck ran him over smashed his car into pieces he died on the scene he went straight to heaven right away he was so dead that he was actually dead for 90 minutes and they didn't pull his body. The medics came, they saw how he was gone. They didn't even pull his body. They just said for people to come and cut the car and they just left him there. He was already in heaven. Another minister was driving by and saw Don dead in the car. Only one hand was unbroken. Every part of his body's bones were broken. Only one hand was it. So this minister takes his hand and starts praying for some time now remember 90 minutes dead for 10 minutes when you die your brain you, be, you become a vegetable for 90 minutes you're gone even if you come back for some miracle you're, you're a vegetable this minister is praying for him is praying for him and dawn is in heaven hears Jesus talks to uh, his grandfather all of these people and then gets sucked in into a cold black hole and goes back into his body and hears this minister singing so wakes up so the minister runs to the ambulance and says, listen, this guy is alive. Of course they say, you crazy. They get in their car and drive away. He runs ahead of the ambulance, lies on the, on the road and said, you can't leave. This guy is alive. Trust me. If you leave, run me over. So of course they didn't run him over. They went just so that he can get off of the road, check Don's pulse and find out Don is alive. Now, wow, this is incredible. Hell begun for him. He had 34 surgeries. They virtually, virtually every bone he had in his body was broken and shattered. 
So think about this. Encounter with heaven. Some Baptist preacher decided to pray you from heaven to earth. I asked Don if he forgave that Baptist preacher. <laughs> Bring you here. God does, I mean, and interesting, when the Baptist preacher prayed for him, he prayed for one thing, that his brain doesn't get damaged. I'm like, he probably should have added that his bones don't get broken. <laughs> So God supernaturally protected his brain but not the rest of his body. 34 surgeries, every bone broken. For 11 months on his left leg he wore a special bone growth device called external fixator. It was basically medieval torture instrument causing him excruciating pain. He said he did not sleep for about two years. The only time he dozed off was out of pain. That's after heavy dose of medication. He said when people came into his hospital room and they saw that thing, people collapsed in his room. It was so scary. Two years of excruciating pain. He, he was a pastor. He fell into heavy depression. And he says, Lord, why did you do this? Why did you bring me back into a hell hole? The doctor says, you'll never walk. You'll never have a movement of your body. I saw heaven. Why am I here on this earth? And then they put this thing because the doctor refused to amputate his leg. He wanted to save this leg. So this piece that they were growing the bone, they've never tried this on any other human being. He was the first experiment. So he said, I don't have nobody to relate to. I'm going through this very difficult time. Nobody to talk to. Nobody could comfort me. And right there during one of the mornings at 3 a.m. the Holy Spirit rebuked him and he said, stop pity yourself. And he says, I can use your trial for your testimony. He says, get your eyes off of yourself and think about other people that you can help. Right there, it's almost like God has no mercy. But that's what it took to pull this man out of self-pity. He says, that day is when I started to live. Hope came back. Future came back. People came to the hospital to encourage him. He ended up encouraging them. He started to talk about heaven. Very shortly, he regained the, the use of his legs. He started to walk. He started to lift his hands. And God restored all the mobility. He started to share the testimony. And the book was written that touched millions of people. Movie was made. And now another movie is coming out. And it came out of a place of pain. Out of a place of misery. Out of a place of struggle. Out of a place of prison out of a place of difficulty. I want to challenge some of you. Wake yourself up. Stop that self-pity party. Stop crying over the past. Stop whining over what did not happen. Let go of the people that mistreated you. Cry a river, build a bridge and get over it. And begin to go to the new season in your life because what is ahead of you is greater than what is behind you. What you're stepping into is greater than what you are coming out of. What you are stepping into is greater than what you are going through. God did not save you to leave you in this pit. God did not protect you to leave you in this mess. Rise up. Somebody shout no compromise. Somebody shout no self-pity. Serve God in your struggle. Everyone rise to your feet. Serve your way out of your problem sign up and serve in your church you're going through a difficult time we're not saying ignore the pain we just simply say don't let the pain become your god don't let your suffering become your lord serve in spite of it and that's what joseph did he served and guess what happened one guy that he served right there in that jail eventually connected him to pharaoh and joseph got out of that place seasons changed the cycle was broken I have a word for some of you here today. The reason why you're fighting hell like you're fighting is because you're fighting family's demons. You're fighting cycles that have been passed on from the grandfather, great-grandfather, to the father, to the mother, and everybody gave in to those cycles. But you're different. You are Joseph. You will break the cycle. You will break the chain. 
that thing that's been going around in your family it hits you and it's not gonna get through you it stops with you the cycle of poverty the cycle of rejection the cycle of abuse the cycle of trauma and that's why some of you say why is this so hard it's because you're not just trying to break through you're trying to disconnect yourself from the benefits Satan has been deriving by torturing your family tree you are trying to break the cycle of lying cheating infidelity sin and immorality and that's why you're gonna have to come against the hellish forces of demonic spirits but you are not alone the God of victory is on your side the God of all victory is on your side and he is encouraging you today and he's letting you know you are a chain breaker you will break the cycle over your family you will begin to have a breakthrough in your finances you will have breakthrough in your family you will have breakthrough in your marriage and you will have breakthrough in your ministry can somebody say amen? amen no compromise and no self-pity I'm a cycle breaker I'm a chain breaker my breakthrough will break the cycle of stagnation limitation defeat and failure in Jesus name I want to give an opportunity first and foremost to people in this room who don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and as their Savior the Bible says it is appointed for men to die and there is judgment the scripture says the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is everlasting life religion cannot save you Catholicism cannot save you Christianity cannot save you only Jesus can save you God doesn't have grandchildren oh but I got confirmed um, in the church the question is are you born again do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior will he on the day of judgment say I knew you or will he say we never met my question is not do you know about Jesus do you know Jesus a lot of you know about me but you don't know me because we don't have a relationship you don't have my number I don't have yours you can know a lot about Jesus by going to church and listening to things about Jesus and never meet Jesus so my question to you young men today is do you know Jesus young woman do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior just because your mama dragged you here she can drag you to church she cannot drag you to heaven it's gonna have to be your decision today when I was with Everett on my way to uh, to Italy thank you we almost missed the flight we were in the lounge Delta lounge and almost missed the flight we had to run thankfully that they held the plane for us I wonder how many people come to a conference like this it's like a Delta lounge you get to see the power of God you get to meet awesome people you get to worship but the church is the airport Jesus is the airplane airports don't take you to your destinations they connect you with the vehicle that does the church is here to point you to Jesus who died on the cross who wants to forgive you of your sin deliver you from your addiction wash you right now and make you brand new creation the greatest miracle is not your deliverance it is your salvation it is you going from darkness into light it is your name being written in the book of life and right now is the hour of decision right now is the time of decision where you must make a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life if you saw deliverances yesterday here heard the healings today this is what Jesus offers freedom healing and life what Satan offers depression death suicide abuse hatred jealousy and eternal lake of fire and I want to tell you today dump the devil and run to Jesus I want to ask you today break up with demons and get together with Jesus I want to tell you today I want you to turn to the devil and say devil we are done today I break up with you I will be team Jesus from today forward I'm joining Jesus's army I'm tired of being your slave if you are here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you don't know where you will spend eternity I'm gonna ask you right now to quickly come out of your seat and come stand right here 
if you walked away from Jesus you used to have a relationship with Christ but stuff happened and you left your Christian faith and you are a backslider and people are praying for you and you are not right with the Lord quickly get out of your seat right now and run to the front if you're in the second sanctuary you can come as well ushers will let you in quickly don't walk run and I want you to get on your knees before the Lord. I want you to get on your knees before the Lord. You're not looking at me. I want you to be talking to Jesus right now. I want you to be telling Jesus I'm sorry. I want you to be asking God for forgiveness right now. This is your moment not to be cute. This is your moment to be broken before the King of glory who died on the cross for all of your sin. I know there's more people, young people, for those of you who are battling with those things you heard young people share today your solution is at the altar not in the needle your solution is not in the razor your solution is on the cross quickly come to the front don't take your life lay your life down at the altar give your life to Jesus he will give you the power to deal with your parents divorce he will give you the power to deal with your insecurity he will give you the power to deal with your struggle come lay your life at the altar Jesus is worthy of everything you are afraid of losing tonight and cry out to him this is not a moment to look at me this is not a moment to look at the stage this is a moment to close your eyes and look at the cross look at the one who died on the cross for you right now he is washing you with his blood as you're confessing your sin as you're confessing your trust in him his blood is washing you right now you sure I see more people coming out. Let's go quickly. Let's go quickly. Some of you are coming with your friends. Come with your friends. Friends, don't let friends go to heaven, to hell. Bring your friend with you and say, listen, if this call is for you, let's go together. You get on your knees before the Lord and you ask Jesus to wash you with his blood. Everybody else, stretch your hands. Begin to intercede for them right now that God will do a miracle, a heart transplant, a heart transplant. Touch them, Lord, right now. Touch them, Lord, right now. In Jesus' name. Bring forgiveness. Grant them repentance right now. Grant them repentance right now, Lord break the pride break the religion there's brokenness that is happening at this altar right now people are crying people are repenting God is lifting the burden of shame he's taking the guilt of your sin the guilt of that abortion the guilt of that homosexual tendencies the guilt of those homosexual acts he's taking the guilt of that lying and cheating he's taking the pain that caused you to numb yourself with those things go from boyfriend to boyfriend from man to man God is healing that pain right now by his precious spirit and by his blood those of you here at the altar I want you to stretch your hands like this and say this prayer out loud with me say Lord Jesus Christ I believe you are the Son of God who died on that cross for all my sin I repent of my sin and I ask you right now please wash me with your blood wash my heart wash my mind wash my life with your blood make me new heal my pain deliver me from my trauma from my addictions and the cycle of defeat I give you my life I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross and you were buried and you rose again and you are coming back be my Savior be my Lord and my Messiah in Jesus name Amen
Amen. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe with our heart that God will forgive us. I'm going to ask you your next step is to begin to make God's Word a standard for your life. Get water baptized. If you don't have a local church, join Hungry Jen. Right now I'm going to ask you to gently to rise. And if you can be dismissed, back to your seat. Church, can we give them a round of applause? I know that a lot of you are still going to be processing this. But the miracle that God is doing right now in your heart, keep that. Tell that to somebody that you got saved, that you gave your life to Jesus. We're going to get ready right now to bring the prayer line. But before we bring the prayer line, we're going to do something that we do in the mass prayer. Is we're going to take time to renounce things right now. I want to ask you, if you came here with cigarettes, if you came here with vaping things, electrical cigarettes, or you came here with charms, maybe you have some kind of a thing you picked up at Indian reservation like dream catchers. Perhaps you have a divorce papers. Or you have something in here today that you know it's the work of the enemy in your life. There's some of you here today, you are addicted to pornography on your phone. And your phone has become the trap that the devil has used. As we're going to do a prayer of renouncing right now. If you have something in your possession that does not belong in the Christian possession. Something that is demonic, sinful or ungodly items. We're going to ask you if you want to be free. Now if you want to be bound, God bless you. If you want to be free as we're going to do these renouncing prayers, we're going to invite you to come and to lay it right here at the altar. And that's going to be your way of saying, I am embarrassing this sin. I am being free from this sin and I'm not going to be bound by this addiction. We had a lady who was a worship leader in her church, addicted to smoking all her life few months ago brought those cigarettes down and after that God set her free not only God set her free she was not able to smoke again and now she is completely free just come and just lay it right here at the altar just right here on the altar on the altar yep just put it down just put it down just put it down just put it down come on right here right here yeah right here right, yeah yep just put it down right there just put it down right there yeah yeah ushers can guide them come on come on and if you have a phone, you'll pick up your phone afterwards as a new phone. Not because we're going to give you a new phone, it's because God's going to turn that trap into a tool. But if you are addicted to something, substances, quickly, take it out of your purse, take it out of your thing. If you have things that you are carrying that give you soul ties to your previous boyfriends, rip that stuff off and just lay it down. Lay it down at the altar right now. I want you to say this out loud with me. Say, I break. I break. All generational curses. All generational curses. Spoken or unspoken. Spoken or unspoken. On both sides of my family. On both sides of my family. Going back 10 generations. Going back 10 generations. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Say, I renounce. I renounce. Every form of witchcraft. Every form of witchcraft. All sorcery. All sorcery. All divination. All divination. And all occultic involvement. And all occultic involvement. Known or or unknown known or unknown in Jesus name in the name of Jesus say I renounce I renounce every ungodly soul tie every ungodly soul tie and immoral relationship and immoral relationship I repent I repent and ask for forgiveness and ask for forgiveness for any sexual immorality for any sexual immorality in my past or the present in my past or the present say I renounce I renounce all 
all hatred, all hatred, all anger, all anger, all resentment, all resentment, all revenge, all revenge, all retaliation, all retaliation, all unforgiveness, all unforgiveness, and all bitterness, and all bitterness. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, say I renounce, I renounce any and all, any and all addiction to drugs, addiction to drugs. And alcohol. And alcohol. And other substances. And other substances. Say, I repent. I repent. For allowing. For allowing. To keep these things keep me bound. To keep these things keep me bound. Say, I rebuke. I rebuke. And call forth. And call forth. The spirit of pharmakia. The spirit of pharmakia. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Say, I renounce. I renounce. All pride. All pride. Haughtiness. Haughtiness. Arrogance. Arrogance. Vanity. Vanity. Ego. Ego. Disobedience. Disobedience. And rebellion. And rebellion. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' Say, name, I renounce. I renounce all envy, all envy, all jealousy, all jealousy, and covetousness. And covetousness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say, I renounce. I renounce all fear, all fear, all unbelief, all unbelief, and doubt, and doubt. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say, and right now, right now. You demon, you demon, you unclean spirit, you unclean spirit, the cause of my pain, the cause of my pain, and my affliction, and my affliction, anywhere you are, anywhere you are, hiding in my life, hiding in my life, your time, your time has expired, has expired. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I command you, I command you. Out, command it out, open up your mouth, command it out. Demons are coming out all around this room right now. People are manifesting right now. I command those demons come up and out right now. Up and out right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Right now those curses are being broken. Right now those chains are being broken. And God is setting you free in Jesus' mighty name.